YouTube channel because the videos for these shows are there available for you to watch and for you to share on whichever social media platform you would like. So we want to welcome you back for this next show. We have another show after this one tonight, three shows tomorrow, three shows Friday before the weekend, and then we're going to come back next week for another full week of a, a great show. So thank you so much for being here with us. With us. It is our privilege uh, to have you here. Now, we have one more great show for you, as usual. This show is called Heresies and the God of the Bible. And once again, we have some great guests on this show. Uh, we've been blessed to have uh, usually at least one uh, doctor of a particular uh, topic on all of our different shows that we've had. But it's a little bit different because we have uh, three uh, professors on this show. And our first guest is Dr. Lynn Wilder. For 30 years, Dr. Lynn Wilder was an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And she served in various leadership positions and eventually earned a tenured professorship at Brigham Young University. However, after fervent study of the Bible, she came to faith in the biblical God, compelling her to leave the Mormon Church and Brigham Young University. And she is now a professor in the College of Education at Florida Gulf Coast University. She and her husband, Michael, co-founded a ministry uh, called Ex-Mormon Christians United for Jesus. And together, they teach the doctrinal differences between Mormonism and, Christi and biblical Christianity. And every day, their ministry assists the many Mormons who are exiting the Mormon Church or the Church of Jesus Christ as Latter-day Saints is uh, also uh, a term used for them as well. And they're, they're helping these Mormons move into a relationship with the God of the Bible, not the God of the Book of Mormon or who, what they believe the Bible to be. But she has uh, two great books that we would recommend that you pick up on Amazon or anywhere where fine books are sold. She has a book called Unveiling Grace, the story of how we found our way out of the Mormon church. And also a, a smaller uh, booklet called Seven Reasons We Left Mormonism, a quick guide to the doctrinal differences between Mormon teachings and the Bible. And you'll be able to hear some of those tonight and get a little, a little taste of what you'll find in her book. We had her on a, on a, a show the other day and we have her now and we have her uh, uh, tomorrow as well. So I want to welcome back Dr. Lynn Wilder to the show. Thank you, Tony. I'm glad to be here. I love what you do. So welcome to Apologetics Week. <laughs> Thank you so much. Our next professor on this show is Dr. Edward Dalcor. He is the president and founder of the Department of Christian Defense, a Christian apologetic ministry based in Los Angeles, California. He also serves as tutor for Greenwich School of Theology in uh, London, England, and he holds the appointment of senior lecturer at the Northwest University Faculty of Theology in Potchefstroom, South Africa. Dr. Dalcor holds a master in apologetics from Columbia Evangelical Seminary and a doctorate of philosophy and dogmatic theology from Northwest University. He, and an, he is an international speaker and has been featured on many Christian and secular radio and TV networks. He is a theological author and contributor to various Christian organizations, books, theological journals, publications, and numerous counter-cult and apologetic tracts and pamphlets. So Dr. Dalcor, it is our privilege to have you on this show. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here again. Thank you. Our third professor on this show is philosopher and theologian Ken Samples. He is a, a, has a great passion to help people understand the reasonableness and relevance of Christianity's truth claims. He earned his undergraduate degree in philosophy and social science from Concordia University and his master's in theological studies from Talbot School of Theology. For seven years, Ken worked as a senior research consultant and correspondence editor at the Christian Research Institute and regularly co-hosted with popular call in, the call in, popular call-in radio program, The Bible Answer Man, with Dr. Walter Martin. Ken is also the, a senior researcher at Reasons to Believe, and he is the author of several books, including Without a Doubt, A World of Difference, Christian Endgame, and Seven 
truths that change the world. He's also the featured scholar in Straight Thinking, a podcast dedicated to encouraging Christians to utilize sound reasoning in their apologetics. Ken currently lectures for the Master of Arts program in Christian apologetics at Biola University, and he encourages Christians everywhere to develop a logically defensible faith. At the same time, he also challenges skeptics to engage Christianity at a philosophical level. So Dr. Ken Samples, I had the, uh, well, the privilege and, uh, and honor of meeting you just a, a couple of months ago, so it is great to have you on this program here. Well, thank you, Tony. This is a real privilege to be with you and your other guests, so this is going to be a great time. Thank you. Looking forward to it. So we want to uh, welcome you, our worldwide audience, to this show again. We know we, this show is being broadcast in the Middle East, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Europe, parts of the United States, etc. So we want to welcome you here and sit back and relax while we talk about heresies and the God of the Bible. Now, all of our uh, professors who are here tonight, they have their areas of expertise. And in the order that I introduced them, I'm just going to kind of stay in that order as we go through. But as you heard, Dr. Lynn Wilder is an expert in Mormonism, having been a Mormon for uh, over 30 years and even a professor at BYU, the most prestigious Mormon uh, school in the United States. So I want to uh, ask her a question first, because when, when we say heresies and the God of the Bible, uh, we're obviously making a distinction there and saying that the God who we find in the Bible is not the God who is talked about in all these different man-made religions throughout the world, whether it be Islam, Mormonism, uh, or different theological cults. And when we say theological cults, we don't mean that in a derogatory way but that they have strayed from biblical Christianity, and it is not considered uh, sound. It's, it is not orthodox. So uh, let's go to Dr. Lynn Wilder first. And Dr. Wilder, uh, who is God the Father, quote-unquote, in Mormonism, and how does he differ from the God of the Bible? Dr. Lynn Wilder, do we still have you on? I am here. Can you hear me? Okay, yes, we have you now. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. First of all, in Mormonism, um, the Trinity is a heresy. They believe that God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit are three separate gods. So technically, Mormonism is polytheism. That's one of the main ways that it differs from biblical Christianity. And this God of Mormonism is very different from the God of the Bible. He started out as a some heavenly father and heavenly mother had celestial sex and he was born a spirit child, eventually came to an earth to gain a body where he was a man, and then he earned his way eventually, perhaps through eons of time, to become a god. He has a body, a glorified body of flesh and bone. Mormonism is very materialistic, and the way I see it, this body of flesh and bone limits him. He can't be all places at once. Um, he's, he's not omnipresent. Uh, he's not omniscient. So that would be very different from the God of the Bible. Okay, yes, yes indeed. And, and not only that description do we see is, is not what we find in, in the Bible, and I, I said just a, a few moments ago that we see uh, what we consider in Mormonism to be a, a heresy or a theological uh, cult because it does not line up with bib biblical Christianity. But I want to go to Dr. Dalcor and ask him, how far off can a particular religious group be in, before we have to say that it is non-Christian and, and why should we even care? Well, first of all, Jesus made it clear in John 8, 24, unless you believe that I am, you will perish in your sins. So I think that's a given when we look at passages like that, also in John 17, 3, where Jesus defines eternal life as having knowledge of the true God. Um, when we look at these passages, we must understand that any, any violence or any um, diversion to the person finished work of Christ, which would include the Trinity, of course, and it would include his finished work 
would be heretical. Um, we have essential theology, which has to do with those issues. Then we have secondary theology that has to do with, you know, things we can debate about, um, eschatology, forms of baptism, so on and so forth. But the church is centered around the person, finished work, and nature of Jesus Christ. So these, these issues are non-negotiable. Even if you hold, for instance, a Roman Catholic would hold to the doctrine of the Trinity, I would reject that because they deny the sufficiency of the work of the Jesus Christ of biblical revelation. You can't deny his work and say, hey, I'm a Christian because I hold to the deity of Christ or the Trinity. Um, it's very important that the Christian understands, at least in terms of evangelism, the, the audience to which he's evangelizing and the issues here. And we have to be definitive on these substantive issues that have to do with his nature, finished work of Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you. And we see how important the, the Trinity is. I mean, sometimes that's a really deep uh, doctrine to, to talk to our brand new Christian friends about. I mean, we know, okay, we, we want to, uh, you know, point them to Jesus Christ and say, hey, you know, we are sinners, we've sinned against a holy God, but he sent his son to die on our behalf. Then he rose from the dead three days later. Repent and put your trust in him. And the Trinity doesn't seem to be something that we, that we bring up uh, right away uh, with people when we're uh, partaking in evangelism or even sometimes with brand new uh, Christians who just repent and put their trust in Christ. But we know that it is biblical. And unlike some groups out there who say that we are polytheists, who believe that we are uh, worshiping three gods when we look to the Bible and say there's only one God, but people say, well, you, you know, Father's God, Son is God, Holy Spirit is God. Okay, well, that's three gods. You're polytheist. But uh, Dr. Samples, what is the Trinity and what is it not? Yeah, very good. Well, the word Trinity really comes from two words, triunity, three and one a uh, Latin term that Tertullian used, Trinitas. So it's very important to recognize that Trinitarian theology is thoroughly monotheistic. We believe in one God and only one God, but we believe that that one God exists or subsists in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the doctrine of the Trinity is a unique type of monotheism, different than traditional monotheism that we see, for example, in both traditional Judaism and, this, and Islam. So it's important to underscore that Trinitarianism is a unique form of monotheism, and yet there is a plurality or a diversity of persons within the nature of God that is very different than what you find in Islam and even in the understanding of traditional Judaism. Okay. And, and when we have this correct understanding of the Trinity, and we say, okay, there's one God, three persons, or one what and three who's, and each of those who's are the same what, or same divine nature, uh, but, but three different persons. And we see all three persons in the, uh, new, new, throughout the Bible, but of, of course we see the New Testament, we see Jesus and, of course, the Holy Spirit, who is, is called God. But when we look to Mormonism, which is not the second uh, biggest religion in the world, which would be uh, Islam af after Christianity, and not even the fastest growing. But I mean, there are millions of Mormons who are, th are throughout the world, and they are very uh, evangelistic, quote unquote, just that, of course, they don't have the true gospel. But when, when they talk about Jesus, uh, we need to know that this is a, a different Jesus than who we find in the Bible as well. So Dr. Wilder, who is Christ in Mormonism, and how does Christ differ from the Jesus Christ who we find in the Bible if we read the New Testament? Well, let me start with a quote from President Hinckley himself. This was the most recent Mormon prophet, not the current Mormon prophet, but the one in the 90s. And he said this, in bearing testimony of Jesus Christ, this is what he said, those outside of the Mormon church who say that Latter-day Saints do not believe in the traditional Christ, he answered them, no, I don't. The traditional Christ of whom they speak is not the Christ of whom I speak. So right there you have from the lips of a Mormon prophet um, the idea that the traditional Christ is not the Christ that the Mormons worship. 
Now, how are they different? They're different in a number of ways. The Jesus of the Bible did not begin as God. So, so in the Trinity, we always say the three persons are co-equal and co-eternal. They've always been there. They've always been together. They always will be, and they are co-equal. Well, Mormonism breaks both of those two. Um, God the Father earned his godhood first. Then Jesus of Mormonism earned his godhood. So God the Father is farther along, ha supposedly has more knowledge than Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit came along. Really interesting that the Holy Spirit is called God. God in Mormonism because they believe that you have to have a physical body in order to be a God. Lots and lots of logical things that, that don't add up in Mormonism. So he, he was a spirit child born to Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. He was the oldest spirit child of anyone on this earth. Guess who was the second spirit child of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother? That would be Lucifer. So in Mormonism, Jesus and Lucifer are spirit brothers. That would be um, not biblical doctrine. And then um, some of the early Mormon prophets taught that Jesus was not a virgin birth. He was not con the was not a virgin birth, but that Heavenly Father himself came down with his body and impregnated Mary in the usual way. They typically don't teach that anymore, but that was once very commonly taught. The cross is not revered in Mormonism because supposedly Jesus atoned for our sins in the Garden of Gethsemane where they said he sweat as if great drops of blood. That's what it says in the King James Version. Um, this Jesus teaches a different way to be saved, which for me is the main reason why this is not the same Jesus of the Bible. Um, you must be saved through your own works in Mormonism. And of course, he there's something called eternal progression in Mormonism. He worked his way to Godhood. Those are some pretty major differences. Yes, definitely. And it, it, I think it's just a blessing to have you on the show because there, like I said earlier, there are Mormons throughout the world and they, and also Jehovah's Witnesses too. I mean, when they come to your door, it, they sound like they know what they're talking about. They sound like they know the Bible like the back of their hand. And it is so dangerous when you, as an unsus unsuspecting person, start talking with Jehovah's Witness or Mormon. And especially if you're seeking truth and all of a sudden they're the person who comes and talks with you, then there's a, a, a great chance of you falling into this, uh, this theological cult. And again, when I say the word cult, I, I'm not meaning that in a negative way uh, or even have a negative connotation to it, which I know it kind of has. But uh, we're saying that it strays from biblical Christianity. And so it's theologically cultish, not um, social cultists is what, is what I mean. Um, but uh, Dr. Dalcor, when we talk with uh, other people, I mean, we know that many people in America consider themselves Christian uh, because they were baptized when they were a baby, because they went to church once 10 years ago, et cetera. I mean, a lot of people in America and even other parts of the world consider themselves Christian because that's kind of popular. They, don't, they believe in Jesus, you know, maybe. Um, but when we talk to people, when we talk to people who call themselves call themselves Christians, sometimes we ask them uh, if they believe in the Trinity, and all of a sudden they say, "Oh no, no, I don't believe in the Trinity, but but I'm a Christian." But I mean, how important is the doctrine of the Trinity in Christianity, and especially should be for anyone who calls themselves a Christian? Well, it's, it, it is the marrow of evangelism, and I'd always point out as well, anyone who's evangelizing, yes, we we share our faith in Christ and who Christ is, but if you mention the deity of Christ, you have to explain and what, how he's God in terms of his relationship with the Father. I know my, my friend and I, Anthony Rogers, have been a guest here. We have this conversation all the time. Without the doctrine of the Trinity, you don't have the Son of Holy Scripture. You don't have the Father as well. Now, we, we're not talking about exhaustive knowledge here. We're talking about sufficient knowledge. In other words, a new Christian will have sufficient knowledge that there's one God. He will have sufficient knowledge that Jesus Christ is God. However, he'll have sufficient knowledge that Jesus is not the Father. 
So it's, again, we're talking about the nature of God. Jesus said himself, those who worship God must worship him in what? Spirit and truth. And the truth of the Trinity is that God the Father sends God the Son to die on the cross. God the Holy Spirit regenerates those that the Father gave to the Son. So it's not negotiable to believe in the Trinity. And unfortunately, either they're out of fear or out of ignorance of doctrine, pastors, evangelists, so on and so forth, don't even mention anything about the Trinity in doctrinal statements and in public evangelism. I think that's a mistake because what we're doing is not defining the God that we are embracing. We're not defining him adequately. Now, we talked about, you mentioned the word uh, cults, I'll say non-Christian organizations. I'm much nicer than Paul. The Apostle Paul called them atheists in Ephesians 2.12. He says, anyone without God is atheoi. They don't have God. But these groups, we have to understand that, you know, when we're, when, when they're defining their God, they're very definitive. Why can't we as Christians be definitive as we're taught in Holy Scripture? This is the only way we can differentiate our, uh, our religion, the Christian religion, and who God is from all the non-Christian religions, is who Christ is and what he did on the cross, which would include the doctrine of the Trinity. We can't be as afraid to proclaim how God revealed himself to us. Okay. And, and Dr. Samples, I want to ask you, what is, uh, is the Trinity in the Bible? I mean, we, we all say, yes, we, we think it is. <laughs> And I want you to kind of give some details about that. But we have people throughout the world who are watching. And their first uh, rebuttal, when we say that we are Christians, they'll say, oh, where, where's the Trinity in the Bible? They'll say, show me the word Trinity in the Bible, and I'll, and I'll become a Christian. Or, or show me the word Trinity, where does it say, where did you just, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But how, can you explain to our audience, is the Trinity in the Bible? Answer that question. And then uh, give them, if they have a Bible with them, where can they turn to find well, uh, who we know as the Trinity? Yes, excellent question. These are questions that come up sometimes when I'm talking with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or various other non-Christian sects or cults that come to the door. Uh, well, the word Trinity itself is not in Scripture, but there are a lot of important terms that we don't find directly in the biblical text. For example, the word Bible isn't in the Bible. So it's not concerning that a particular word may not be there, but the doctrine of the Trinity, the teaching of the triune nature of God, is derived directly from Scripture. And so when we look to Scripture, we recognize, first of all, that there's one God. Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We look to the New Testament. In John 17, it says that there is only one true God. But we also recognize that there are three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all three of those distinct persons are called God in Scripture, or they're referred to as God, or they have the nature or the attributes of God. And so uh, we, again, recognize the Father being God in, in 2 Peter. Uh, we recognize there are a number of passages in the New Testament that speak about Jesus uh, as being God and man, uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, um, Titus 2.13, uh, Colossians 1, there are numerous passages. Now, with regard to the Holy Spirit, he is also a divine person. He has the same attributes as both the Father and the Son. Uh, he is in the second verse of Genesis, there in creation. Uh, in the book of Acts, uh, Peter refers to uh, the Spirit as God. And so the doctrine of the Trinity is, is really an inference. It is like a logical inference that has been drawn from Scripture. And as the church reflected upon uh, the holy writings, as it thought through these types of issues, uh, it recognized that God is both one and three. So what is God? Well, there's only one God, one what? but there are three distinct persons, so three uh, who's, if you will, to put it in a philosophical context. Uh, and so the doctrine of the Trinity is an inference drawn from uh, Scripture and defended from Scripture. And I would agree with my uh, two colleagues uh, 
that the doctrine of the Trinity is crucial. It's the cockpit of all Christian thinking. I think we make a mistake, Tony, when we, uh, in an apologetic context, kind of dodge the Trinity. I have found that talking about the Trinity, uh, being forthright about it, defending it, talking about the uniqueness of the Christian God, how distinct it is, even from uh, Yahweh, the uh, God of the Old Testament, and certainly in Islam. So the Trinity is very critical. And unfortunately, so many Christians I know, they believe in the Trinity. They know it's important, uh, but it's kind of a riddle to them, one and three, three and one. I try to encourage them to study the passages uh, and to certainly affirm it uh, in, their, in their prayer life, and in their life of devotion. Amen. Amen. We have a little bit of an audio problem uh, right at the end there. I don't know if we, our, our text can, uh, can work on that. Um, and I just want to take this time to let our, our viewing audience know that the Trinity Channel is here to inform you on, on these great shows that we're having. And we do these apologetics marathons to get truth to the world. And this can only happen because of people like you who support the Trinity Channel. And you'll see a number numbers on the bottom of your screen, depending on which country you're in. But we would invite you to call and to make a monthly pledge to support the Trinity Channel or to give a one-time gift just to help apologetic marathons like this to continue. Uh, the Trinity Channel can also continually has debates throughout the year between Christians and Muslims and, and all different groups to get to truth what corresponds to reality because that's what matters most and there's nothing more important than your eternal salvation and uh, speaking of salvation i wanted to go to dr lynn wilder next and ask her uh, according to mormonism i mean our, our christian friends throughout the world or even if you're not a christian but you know some people who you know you know that they're mormons um you want to kind of ask them, you know, what do you believe about this? But at the same time, it's good to know what the religion actually teaches, to know if the, your friends, coworkers, neighbors, etc., actually believe what the religion teaches, or if they've kind of strayed from that uh, themselves. But Dr. Wilder, uh, how is one saved in Mormonism, and how does that path differ from what the God of the Bible uh, teaches? Well, let me start by making a very important point. When you're talking to Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses, often they'll use the exact same religious speak that Christians do. So they'll use words like angel or salvation or faith or Jesus. And, and because a Christian's talking to someone about that, there is assuming that they have the same meaning behind them. This is not an assumption you can make. You must always drill down and ask, so what do you mean by that? So who is Jesus to you? So what do you do with this scripture that's the opposite of what you just told me? Um, it's really important to recognize that although you're using the same words, you may be miles apart. Um, they may be very contradictory concepts. Eternal life for a Mormon is a very complicated process. There's something called the plan of salvation. I will not go through all the minute steps of the plan of salvation, but the bottom line is that it is a works-based system. So this is, let's see, this is Mormon scripture. This comes out of the manual that the missionaries use um, when they knock on your door. This is their definition of eternal life. This won't sound like the Christian definition. To live forever as families in God's presence. So Mormons build temples, and one of the purposes of those temples is so you can help exalt yourself to a higher kingdom through your works. Another purpose of the temple is so that you can save the dead after they're already dead. And then a third purpose of that temple would be to seal families together 
so that a husband and wife can be married in this life and they believe married in the next life. And if you're sealed together, then your children can live with you in the next life. Well, it says live with heavenly father, but technically if, if a Mormon man works his way to godhood, which is possible in Mormonism, he'll have his own world and his family will be with him so I'm not sure how God manages all those different planets with all those different gods I suppose he visits. And I never could figure out either if your children were sealed to you, but if they grow up and they get married and then they become gods, they'll have their own planets too. So technically you're not living together as families, but that is the definition um, the third article of faith, I believe it is, says that we believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved. Let's put a period there. There should be a period there. But Mormonism puts a comma there, and then they say, you are saved by obedience to the laws and the ordinances of the gospel. Well, that would not be the biblical gospel. That would be the Mormon gospel. And all of those laws and ordinances are very um, time-consuming and... Um, you must do them though, because in the Book of Mormon, in 2 Nephi 25, 23, you are promised that you will be saved by grace after all you can do. I mean, think about that for a minute. If you do all the good works you can do, then at the end of life, or perhaps at the white throne judgment where they believe they'll be, then God's grace will kick in and do the rest. But a Mormon never has assurance of salvation. John 5, 24 says, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Biblical doctrine is when you accept Jesus as your savior, when you, that is when you become a child of God and you have eternal life. That is not Mormon doctrine. You must earn eternal life by going to the temple, by keeping a health code, by paying your tithing, by um, being active in the church, uh, lay ministry for no money, and then by doing all these good works till the end of your life, and if you've done enough, perhaps God's grace will kick in. Okay. Now there's one, there's one exception to that. Um, if the Mormon prophet calls you into the temple for a ceremony called the second anointing, then you can know that your godhood is assured and you are saved. Wow. You will be saved. And how often does that happen? Very rarely, um, my friends posted that right before the election that the prophet had called Romney in. Of course, that oh, could well. be rumors, but um, it does happen from time to time. Okay, we'll have to follow up on, on that story. But um, as, as our audience can see, uh, Mormonism is just one of the many man-made religions out there that do not teach salvation by grace alone through faith alone, even if there's different flavors of works that you have to do in different man-made religions, it's all Jesus plus this, Jesus plus that, uh, something other than Jesus himself and what he accomplished on our behalf. Uh, Dr. Dalcor, when you uh, talk with people, uh, if, if one professes to love Jesus, and devotes his life to him and also to serving others, as we see is the case with uh, Mormons and with other groups. Uh, does one really have to have a correct understanding uh, in the deity of Christ or the justification through faith alone or, or even the Trinity? Uh, we're having a slight audio problem. If you can just pause right there, we're going to try to get you back. One second. They're going to let me know when we're good. Can we hear you now? Yeah. Okay, there Can we go. Please, please oh. re uh, start again. I don't know what I was saying. No. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's absolutely important 
particularly for the evangelist, to define not only the nature of God, but to define how one is saved, because both of those are non-negotiable. How do we know this? Well, Scripture is very clear. Number one, Jesus um, affirms his deity. He also warns of the effect of not believing that he's God in John 8, 24. Again, unless you believe that I am God, ego me, you will perish in your sin. And we're not looking at one verse. When we look at Scripture, like we were talking about the Trinity, the words not in the Bible, is, as Ken said, absolutely not. However, why we use the word is because it defines the biblical data. We start with Revelation, or we start with Genesis, and we end with Revelation. So in these doctrines, we must examine the entirety of biblical revelation, not a verse here, a verse there. In John 8, 24, the verse I just mentioned, Jesus affirms his deity, but he also did it in verse 28. He did it in John 13, 19. He did it in John 18, um, 18, uh, 5, 6, and 8. So he was very clear as to believing that he's God. His apostles affirmed that he was God. His enemies even affirm at least his claims that he was deity. The whole entire scripture denotes that he's God, not just in the New Testament. We see ample examples in the Old Testament where Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ, is God. And we see that in the angel of the Lord. We see that with the plural, um, plural words being used of the one Yahweh. For instance, in, in Genesis 1, 26, in Genesis 3, Genesis 11, Isaiah 6, these are plural nouns, adjectives, um, plural verbs, all denoting the one God. And we also have to be clear when we're defining the Trinity, we were talking about Jehovah Witnesses or Muslims, when we define the Trinity, we have to understand first the Unitarian assumption that most of these groups have, whether it's a one is Pentecostal or a Muslim or a Jehovah's Witness. Their assumption is simply this, God is Unitarian. All those passages that say they're one God, that says there's one God, they interpret it as there's one person. We must deal with that Unitarian assumption uh, that asserts God to be one person. I was just having this conversation, um, sometimes I do open air evangelism with a friend of mine, Lewis, and we get that attack all the time. Well, how can God be a trinity when Scripture says there's one God? We have to deal with that first before we can define the Trinity. And I would say the Old Testament is replete with examples of where we find a multi-personal God fully revealed in the New Testament. Um, if the authors of the Old Testament were Unitarian or they held to a unipersonal deity, certainly we would not find plural adjectives, verbs, noun, and prepositions denoting the one God, because there's one being, not one person, revealed in three distinct persons. So, absolutely necessary to believe how God revealed himself in the pages of Scripture, and, number two, absolutely necessary to understand that we're saved by faith alone, not the cause, through the instrument of faith alone, and the very cause or ground of our salvation, our justification, is the vicarious cross work and his perfect life of Jesus Christ. Look, Paul in Galatians talked about this different gospel. What was this different gospel? Similar to Roman Catholicism, it was dealing with the idea that you must have faith in Jesus as Messiah, but you must also provide meritorious works to somehow gain righteousness. And I would submit in Romans uh, 4, 6, I think Paul's thesis there is condensed. He says, God, legaisatai, credits righteousness apart from works. That really does distinguish us from most of these atheistic non-Christian religions that were saved solely by faith alone, through the instrument of faith alone, not by works, and God credits, not infuses, not in parts, he credits righteousness. It was so important to the authors that virtually in every single book of the uh, New Testament, it's um, delineated point by point these particular issues. Um, so I think it's very important for the Christian evangelist or pastor or Christian layperson to really understand the nature of God and not mess it up. Because if you're not prepared when the Jehovah Witness comes to your door or a oneness Pentecostal who denies Christ, 
when they come to your door. If you're not prepared to talk about these things, close the door. Don't talk with them because you may do more damage than good in terms of uh, rightly and accurately presenting the God of biblical revelation. Definitely. I, I know Dr. Ken Samples is on the show here, and, and Dr. Wal Walter Mar Martin, who he used to work with, I remember a quote that he had made was that the average Jehovah's Witness can tie the average Christian in a theological pretzel in about 60 seconds. So as uh, you are hearing, our uh, professors we have on this show, they are giving many Bible verses. You might not be able to be writing them down as quickly as they are throwing them out there. So uh, we want to remind you that this show is going to be available on the Trinity Channel's YouTube channel probably within a half hour after the show concludes. It will be there for you to watch, for you to uh, rewind as much as you need to to write down these different Bible verses and, and, and soak up the, uh, these tips that uh, our professors are giving us. And also we would encourage you uh, to call in and ask a question to one of our, our panelists. We have numbers on the bottom of your screen that you can see and call in. We actually need to take a break right now. Unfortunately, I'd love to stay here and keep asking questions. But we need to take a break just for uh, two to three minutes. But uh, please come back and join us once again as we are so blessed to have our guests with us to talk about uh, this important topic of heresies, because there's a lot of them, versus the God of the Bible. We'll see you in just a few minutes. To all our viewers, you can now watch our shows on the following platforms such as Android tablets, Android boxes, Android phones, a Chromecast stick, your smart TV, or a Roku stick. For more information, please call the number on your screen or visit us at trinitychannel.com. Trinity Channel is now publicly streaming on Roku. There is no need for a code anymore, and through Roku, you can watch us 24-7 on your TV. You can find us through two ways on Roku. The first way is through the streaming channel category. The second way is by searching for Trinity Channel in your search bar. For more information, please call the numbers at your screen. Matthew in his gospel says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come Hello friends and welcome back to the Trinity Channel during our first Apologetics Marathon of 2016. It is a blessing to have you here with us and if this is your first show that you're joining us, we would invite you to go to the Trinity Channel's YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube, type in Trinity Channel, it should, it should pull up very quickly and you'll see a bunch of shows, actually hundreds of them that have taken place over the last uh, number of years, but just in the last few days, we're already on show uh, nine that, that, or, or 10 that has taken place just in the last three days alone. So we are having a marathon indeed. It is two weeks long and today is just day three of week number one. So we have many more shows coming up with guests from all over the world, experts in a variety of fields to inform you and to equip you as we share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with those who need to know and understand it. Now on our panel at this, during this show, we have Dr. Lynn Wilder, who is a, a former Mormon. We have Dr. Edward Dalcor, and we have uh, Ken Samples. And it, it is such a blessing to have them here. And we actually do have a caller. I'm not sure who, the, who their question is going to be for. We will go ahead and ask them. But we do encourage you to call in and ask questions. So our first caller, her name is Jessica. Jessica, can you, can you hear me? Jessica, are you on the line? Okay, I think we have a problem with uh, our caller, or at least the connection, not with the caller. But <laughs> we thank you for calling in, and please, we encourage more people to call in as well. Uh, let's go to Dr. Uh, uh, Ken Samples. Uh, sir, we, we've been talking about Mormonism. We've been talking about uh, the Trinity in general. 
And what I wanted to do is give you a couple questions on, say, uh, Judaism and also Islam. We, ha we have a large amount of Muslim viewers throughout the world, and about 70% of all of our marathon is on Islam. That's, that's common because we know we have a large Muslim audience. So I want to I get to that uh, after this next one. But um, we see that Christianity is birthed from Judaism, and we know that Many people throughout the world say that they're Jewish, and that can mean many things nowadays. But when we say Judaism, we say the Judaism of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in that sense, Christianity is, say, a fulfillment of Judaism. But how does the idea of a triune God, consistent with a Shema, uh, which declares, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one? Yeah, this is, uh, this is a great question. Jews and Christians uh, share the, the Bible, that is, Christians look to the Hebrew Scriptures, the, the Old Testament, as the Word of God. So the question comes up, the earliest Christians were Jews, yet these early Jews worshipped Jesus as God in human flesh, as the divine Messiah. But how does that uh, divinity of Christ then relate back to uh, the monotheistic affirmation in the Old Testament, particularly in what, the, what is called the Shema, uh, Deuteronomy 6 and following. Well, some of these points have been made uh, earlier, and I, I think there are very good points. Uh, even if you look to the uh, statement there in the Shema, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, Elohim is a quantitative noun. It is not a mathematical singularity. Uh, even the word one uh, is not the kind of unity that you find in, in Islam. Uh, ehad is a word that is used in another place in Genesis. The two became one flesh. So I think you do find in the Old Testament, and I remember uh, talking with a, uh, a Jewish rabbi, talking about God, talking about scripture, Christianity, and Judaism. And I asked him, is there is there anything in the Old Testament that would explicitly prohibit uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. And so we went back and forth a while defining and clarifying the Trinity. But he ultimately said, now I don't believe in the Trinity. I believe in a single solitary God, Yahweh. But he said, there isn't anything necessarily that would uh, prohibit the doctrine of the Trinity. So uh, certainly Christians and Jews and you have a variety of different Jews. You have uh, some who are very liberal theologically. Uh, you have the more conservative, orthodox, even ultra-orthodox. And you have many secular Jews who are kind of Jewish in a cultural way, but not in a theological orientation. But uh, I would argue that the doctrine of the Trinity is consistent with the Old Testament. Uh, it certainly finds uh, greater description and fulfillment in the New Testament, uh, but certainly the, uh, the point of takeoff is that the earliest Christians were all Jews, and yet they, they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, they saw him uh, as being divine. And so, yes, the doctrine of the Trinity is very critical, um, and our view of the deity of Christ. So uh, the Trinity would say God is one what and three who's. But when we look to the deity of Christ, uh, he's one who and two what's. He's a single person with both a divine and human nature. So I think the doctrine of the Trinity is in fact consistent with the Old Testament. There may be passages where Jews and Christians would look at them differently or interpret them differently. But I see nothing in the Old Testament that would rule out explicitly the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay. Thank you so much for that uh, great explanation. And especially because we know that people throughout the world have different neighbors who, who believe different things, who consider themselves to be different, uh, part of a different group. So it's great to have all of our guests on and be learning about these variety of uh, man-made religions that, that are out there because these can't all be true because they're, they're contradictory. So uh, it's, it's logically impossible for them to all be true, and, and so what we're trying to get to is the truth itself that we find in the Bible. But we do have, I believe, two callers now. So you want to go ahead and go to the first one, and we want to go to Lois. Lois, can you hear me? Yes, it's Lewis. 
Lewis. Okay. Thank you, Lewis, for calling in. And who uh, is your question for, for and, and who, uh, what is your question? Uh, my question is to Dr. Del Court. Um, I do talk to a lot of people from different backgrounds. And oftentimes they'll say that, uh, for instance, I read an article uh, by an uh, ex-Muslim who said that while he was a Muslim and now that he's a Christian, a uh, professing Christian, that he doesn't see that he had any different view of God, that he thought that he was worshiping the same deity as a Muslim and even now as a Christian, that there are other things that might be different. Uh, so my question is, uh, are people ignorantly thinking that they are worshiping the same deity simply because of superficial overlay, such as claiming that he's creator or that he's one or that uh, he has certain attributes that might overlap, and therefore they assume that they're worshiping the same God as referenced in the Bible, which would be Yahweh? Okay. Dr. Dalcor, did you hear the question? Uh, let's fix the audio for Next. Dr. Dalcor, please. Uh, yeah, uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, please start over. Oh. I'm sorry. We apologize for that. That was, a, that was an excellent question because I meet many who say they uh, were either had the same faith or they don't see the differences or so on and so forth. But, of course, this is just a, a question of biblical ignorance. I think the Apostle John answers this clearly in, in 1 John 2, um, 22, when he says, Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and Son. Then he says in verse 23, Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father and the Son. So, whoever denies the Son in verse 23 does not have the Father. Um, he doesn't confess the Father. He has a different Father. So, you can't remove the Son from the doctrine of God or you don't have God. These, uh, I deal a lot with um, um, Jewish folks, uh, unsaved, and, and even Messianic Jews who have this idea that Jews are, they're not really in an unsaved saved state, but they're not saved yet, but they do have the right God of the Old Testament. Many Muslims would also assert that. But according to the Apostle John, writing by divine inspiration, they're dead wrong because John says, if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father and he calls him Antichrist, probably the worst term that John could have used. So that was a very good question because we get this a lot. We just have to, you know, be biblically literate on these basic issues to communicate. You can't remove the Son from the Godhead. You can't remove the Son from the nature of God because there's three persons who share the nature of the one God. We see this from Genesis 2, Revelation. And it's very important that we understand that it's not two concepts of God, as mentioned before. There's a ton of plural verbs, adjectives, nouns, um, in the old, and prepositions that are plural in the Old Testament, denoting that God is not Unitarian, but he's uh, multipersonal. What do we do with Isaiah 54, 5? Um, For you are our husbands in the Hebrew, uh, is your makers whose name is the Lord of hosts. Same with uh, Job 35.10, which we read, but no one says, where is God, my makers? Since God is multipersonal, plural nouns can be applied to him. But since there's one being, singular nouns can be uh, applied to him. One of my favorites is Ecclesiastes 12.1. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Creator there in the Hebrew is plural. Remember your creators. Now, this is consistent with the doctrine of the Trinity. So these folks that say, well, I have the God of the Old Testament, or I always had that faith, they're dead wrong because Scripture says if you deny the Son, you don't have the Father. Amen. That was a good call. Very good question. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I'm sure our viewers around the world are, are thinking, man, these professors know their stuff. And I agree. That's why I was not have on the show. That's why they're professors. But not only would it be good to rewatch these shows, write down all these points and these verses, but as you can see, it's hard to defend the faith if we don't know the faith. So this should be an encouragement and an exhortation to our Christian brothers and sisters throughout the world to know why you believe what you believe. I mean, if you've repented and put your trust in Christ, then yes, you, you are saved. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we have the tools that we need to go out and effectively 
effectively share the gospel with people and to defend the historic Christian faith, which we're all called to do. You know, we're called to, in the Bible to go and share the gospel, but we're also called to defend our faith with gentleness and respect. So we want to know it and be able to defend it. Now we have a, another caller, and I believe her name is Jessica. Do we have Jessica on the line? Jessica, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? I can this time. Thank you for calling back. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, first, I really, really enjoy the show, and I'm learning so much. Great. Thank you. Is there, I'm um, actually wondering if there's differences between heresies and religions. And my question to any of the speakers who are willing to answer, um, is it normal for heresies to turn to new religions? And if they do turn to new religions, do they eventually evolve over time or not? Okay. Thank you for your call. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass that to Dr. Ken Samples. Yeah, Jessica, that's a that's a great question. I, I really do appreciate that. I I think it's important to recognize that a heresy is not just any difference. There are secondary differences. Presbyterians and Baptists would differ over baptism, for example. Christians differ about end time discussion. There are secondary areas of, of difference. And sometimes theological traditions have pretty pretty significant differences one with another. A heresy is such a serious departure from historic Christianity that it distorts the very nature of it. It, it stops being Christianity and becomes something very, very different. And so uh, with Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, their Christology, their view of Christ, is very similar to the ancient Arian heresy of the fourth century. Uh, the United Pentecostals, the Oneness Pentecostals, uh, their view of Jesus, uh, very similar uh, to, uh, to modalism or Sabellianism, if you will. So what I find very interesting is that here church history can play a very important role. Uh, there were many challenges and heresies that emerged in church history. Uh, we had great theologians at the time who responded Christian apologist who responded. So I like to say that uh, most of the cults, and again, we're using the word their cult, not in a sociological sense, but a theological sense, or maybe the terms now are a heretical sect. Uh, many of these groups are really kind of ancient heresies dressed up in space suits. And uh, oftentimes we can learn a great deal from studying church history. How did how did Christian orthodoxy respond to the Arian heresy that said that Jesus is not the same substance as the Father, but, but is only a similar substance? Or how did the church respond to Sabellianism or to modalism? Um, and so I think that uh, oftentimes uh, these heresies, they, they don't seem to go away. They morph, they change, they evolve but they appear in, in various forms. So you've got tritheism with Mormonism, you've got modalism with the United Pentecostals, and you have a version of Arianism with Jehovah's Witnesses. Definitely. Thank you, Dr. Samples, for that. I want to go to uh, Dr. Lynn Wilder now. And Dr. Wilder, how does one know if something is true in the LDS faith, and how does that differ from how we test for things in the Bible when we, when we look to that. First, I want to just real quickly address the first caller because okay. I literally went through the process of not believing the Trinity and then coming to know the Trinity. You know, salvation for many people there may be a point of salvation, but, but we are washed by the water of the word, it says in the Bible. And the more you're in the word, the more the lies get washed out and the truth gets washed in and these things become um, clear. It took me nearly two years to understand grace. 
I remember being in a church service one day and just going, whoa, I get it, you know? And I would say longer than that, even to get this grasp of James White's book helped me a lot of the Trinity. And so when we walk with people, when I talk to Mormons, if I tell them immediately that um, their, their Jesus is a different Jesus, I mean, eventually we get there, but in the very beginning, that's such a hostile idea that um, they run away often in those first stages. So I just wanted to add that. You. Now your question about how do you know if something's true? This is another wonderful question because in Mormonism, I thought I knew how to test truth. In Mormonism, you test truth with feelings. The end of the Book of Mormon challenges you to ask if these things are not true and then get this feeling. And if you have a good feeling, that's supposed to be the Holy Spirit telling you it's true. Or um, there are a number of things um, in Mormonism, like in Doctrine and Covenants, it says you, you're supposed to ask this Holy Spirit, and we don't know what spirit that is, if Mormonism is right or if something's right, and then I'll cause that your bosom will burn within you. What does the Bible say about trusting feelings? It says the heart is deceitful above all else. In Matthew 15, 19, I often use this with Mormons. It says, out of the heart come evil thoughts. And then one of the things listed is false testimony. Right out of feelings comes something that can be very heartfelt and appear to be very sincere, but be very wrong. So in biblical Christianity, of course, we test John 4, 1, we test the spirits with the word of God. Um, the whole antidote for going the wrong way is the word of God. In Acts 17, they reasoned from the scriptures. The wonderful thing about faith in Jesus, you can use reason because the Bible reconciles. It makes sense from one end to the other and it's consistent. And that was really clear to me when I read the word. Okay, thank you. Dr. Dalcor, I want to uh, pass it to you because there's a, a couple of terms that came up already a couple of times in the show. Uh, one is a oneness Pentecostals and some people, when you talk to your friends about that, they say, oh yeah, I know someone who's a oneness Pentecostal, but usually a more common term that they'll hear is apostolic, which uh, from, from what I'm aware is, is just about at the same uh, level there, if not exactly the same. So uh, would you uh, help the, the, our audience around the world, when they have a friend who is apostolic, one is Pentecostal, um, and they, that sounds, again, Christian do. They're using the same uh, terms but with different dictionaries as we know, but um, can you tell our audience why one is Pentecostalism slash um, a, 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 being apostolic? Uh, is that official Christian doctrine? If not, why not? And um, can, we, can we even call it Christian when, when we finally get down to uh, the brass tacks and what, what it actually is? Sorry, good question. Um, you know, one is Pentecostals are probably the only, one of the only non-Christian religions, denominations, organizations that assert Jesus is God. But where the defect is, as with all these other groups, there's always a defect in some kind of perception or doctrine of the nature of God. Their defect is simply this. They have a radical view of monotheism, a view of monotheism that's tantamount to universalism, as we were talking before. Most of these groups see one God as one person. Where oneness Pentecostal errs in a Christological, heretical way is they deny the eternality of the Son. In their view, there's only one God, one person who is the Father. Okay. Well, in the Old Testament, you know, that one God passage in Deuteronomy 6 4 and all those others, that refers to only the Father. Only the Father is God. So what happens? Well, we do find that Jesus is God. So in their theology, Jesus Christ is the name of the Unitarian deity. His name is Jesus. And he comes out sometimes as the Father when he's God, sometimes as the Son, which is 
um, represents his humanity, and sometimes he comes out as the Holy Spirit in his deity. So you have a, a monad, you have a Unitarian God named Jesus, but there's no distinction of persons. Jesus is not unipersonal to them. Jesus is not the uh, pre-incarnate person distinct from the Father, as he prays in John 17, 5. Jesus did not, as Son, did not become flesh. They believed that a mode became flesh. It was part of the Father's Word that became flesh, not the Son who became flesh. Virtually every doctrine is denied, the doctrine of mediatorship, the doctrine of priesthood, the doctrine of the incarnation of the Son, because all these doctrines are predicated on the pre-existence of the Son, the unipersonality of the Son, distinct person from the Father. So absolutely not are these groups Christian. As Paul says, they're atheistic. And also I would say not only are they, some would refer them to a non-Christian cult, but um, you know, I, I probably have a different view of cult because I do see them as sociological cults. Uh, I look at Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, Oneness Pentecostals, the Church of um, um, the International Church of Christ as not only theologically cultic, but sociologically cultic because they control every dimension of your life. You cannot leave the church or you leave God. That heavy-handed control is a sociological defect. That's why I refer to them also as sociological cults because every dimension of your life is controlled by the church. You know, we in the Reformation, we have heard of all the solas, denoting that God alone is the sovereign one over salvation, um, and it's to his glory alone. But there was also something in contrast called sola ecclesia, church alone, which Rome asserts, Mormonism asserts, the Watchtower asserts, and all these other groups. In other words, the church alone distributes truth. The church alone is the custo uh, custodian of truth. And we would say that's crazy. That is as non-Christian as you can get. So the bottom line, one is Pentecostal. They deny the distinctions between Jesus, the Son, and the Father. And they come up with it, the same concept as a Muslim. The same concept, a universal God as a Muslim, as a Jehovah's Witness. Okay. The same exact contest, not, uh, um, the same concept is used with all these Unitarian cults. Definitely. Definitely. And, and bringing up Islam again, that's what I wanted to get to next, because well, we know people who, you out there, you, maybe you used to be part of one of these uh, heretical cults, theological cults, etc., and you have left, and you've experienced uh, the shunning and the uh, disowning by family, by friends, etc., uh, but it is, seems to be different for Muslims who leave Islam. There are many parts of the world today where they're under Sharia, uh, Islamic law, and if you leave Islam, you don't just get shunned, you don't just get disfellowshipped, etc., but you can be killed for leaving Islam. And Dr. Dalcor, right there at the end, uh, swung us to Islam, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay right there. And go to do uh, Dr. Samples. What is the biggest complaint or perhaps misunderstanding faiths like Islam have against Trinitarianism? And that's a, that's a great question. Um, I suspect that, like many groups, Muslims would look at the Trinity and view it uh, in, as being tritheism, as being three gods. I mean, even when you open the pages of the Quran and read, and even if you were to study the life of Muhammad, I think it's very clear that Muhammad and the Quran doesn't have a clear understanding of the Trinity. And so uh, the Trinity is easily misunderstood. Uh, while the doctrine of the Trinity is true, while it can be derived from Scripture, nobody fully and completely and exhaustively comprehends the Trinity. We know it to be true. We are taught it in Scripture. Uh, there is certainly mystery with the doctrine of the Trinity. But I think it's very easy for Muslims and for many people, frankly, uh, to come away having uh, a misunderstanding. If I could also make a comment about uh, what we were talking about earlier, I, I think it's very interesting, Tony, that often when you look at groups that end up being outside of historic Christianity, they typically deny two fundamental truths. They deny the Trinity and salvation by grace. And I think often it is because of the 
lack of appreciation that it's the Father who sends the Son into the world. The Father initiates redemption. It's the Son on the cross that says it's finished, accomplishes it. It's the Holy Spirit coming upon the church that applies redemption. And so salvation by grace is uniquely tied to the Trinity. And when we look at Islam, Tony, again we see a religion that is uh, uh, traditionally monotheistic, unitarian, a rejection of the Trinity, and ultimately a religion of works righteousness. And so uh, this is where your theology really uh, is very practical. Uh, groups that deny the Trinity, that deny the deity and uh, deity of the Spirit, as well as the deity of Christ, often have a very convoluted view of, of salvation. And so I, I think uh, in my interaction with Muslims, talking with both Muslim professors as well as uh, various other people, they often come away thinking that it's tritheistic, I think. Okay. And it, it seems like, too, when, when I've talked with Muslims myself, that, the, like you said, they don't have a correct understanding of grace according to biblical Christianity. And I'm glad to have uh, Dr. Wilder on here, too, because she's been on a, a number of shows before where we have compared the many similarities between Islam and Mormonism. There was a show that we did last marathon called uh, Muhammad and Joseph Smith, striking similarities between the prophets of Islam and Mormonism, where we compared 24 similarities between Muhammad and Joseph Smith. Just uh, two nights ago, we had a show called Hajj in the Mormon Temple that's taking one of the five pillars of Islam and the many uh, similarities it has with uh, Mormons trying to make it to the Mormon temple. And uh, Mormonism is commonly, not all the time, but by uh, scholars sometimes called medieval, uh, Islam is considered medieval Mormonism because of the many similarities that are there. And, but uh, Dr. Wilder, what is the definition of grace for a Mormon in particular? And how does it differ from the grace that we see in the Bible? According to the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, the definition of grace is the enabling power that God gives you so that you can live the commandments. And those would be the commandments of the Mormon church so that you, of course, can work your way strongly a works-based faith. Grace, oh my goodness, um, it says in the Bible that, of course, grace and works are completely contradictory. If it's grace, it's not works. If it's works, it's not grace. It can't be both. And if it's works, then Christ died in vain. If you could do one thing to add to what Jesus did for you on the cross, then Christ died in vain. The whole point of the cross is that we are sinful and that God had to take our beating for us and, and take our sin to the cross and defeat death so that we could then be raised. This is nothing that we can do for ourselves. Um, the, the grace of the Bible is a great love that God has for us that he should arrange a way that we could become a child of God, very, very different from Mormonism, which says grace is an enabling power that God gives you so that you can then work your way. Okay. And, and Dr. Dalcor, we, we're talking about the, uh, the true Jesus who we find in the Bible. And of course, Dr. Wilder is telling us this, about this different Jesus who we find in the Book of Mormon and according to the religion of Mormonism or Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But even biblically speaking, when we look to the Bible, uh, can anyone who calls themselves a Christian, even if they're not part, uh, again, of, of course, of a man-made religion, but if they just call themselves a Christian and they, they believe that Jesus died and he, he rose from the dead, they believe that he fulfilled uh, the, the law that we couldn't keep, uh, they, they hold to his deity, they, they say that he is the eternal Son of God incarnate, but then they deny that he has a body now that maybe, not necessarily, I mean, maybe he just rose in spirit form, which Jehovah's Witnesses believe, um, but if he just does not have a body now, if he's not a man now, uh, can, can a person be saved at that point? 
Um, absolutely not. And it's unfortunate. Now we we have to we have to distinguish the difference. There's a lot of Christians who, although they apprehend the Trinity, you know, people always misapply the Trinity by by using the word mystery because of First Timothy three sixteen. First Timothy three sixteen though, when it says the by the common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He was revealed in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, so on and so forth. That is specifically dealing with the incarnation. And also we know in, bibli in, in biblical uh, vocabulary, mysterion was something that was hidden but now revealed. So the incarnation clearly revealed, and I believe the data for the Trinity is clearly revealed, although I rightly agree that we can't totally comprehend but we can apprehend that truth so dealing with the gospel and i call it the gospel the trinity dealing with this gospel paul says in first or in second timothy 2 8 that jesus christ was of the spermatos of david he was the literal bloodline of david according to my gospel that's what paul says so he marks the incarnation the perpetual incarnation according to his gospel. It's not a, a secondary issue. But the question, and I ask this question at churches all the time, does Jesus have a body now? And again, my, my point was, if you have not been adequately taught, but you apprehend the truth, and you might not be able to communicate it, that's different than a oneness Pentecostal or, or uh, rejecting the Trinity or a oneness or a Roman Catholic rejecting faith alone. That's different than saying, I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I believe it, but I have trouble, you know, delineating or, or communicating it. Yeah. Dealing with the question, does Jesus have flesh now? And how so important is this doctrine to one's not only salvation, but just to their, their confession of who Christ is. The Apostle John in 1 John 4, says this. He says, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they're from God. Then he talks about the many false prophets going into the world. Understand, First and Second John was written as an anti-Docetic or Gnostic polemic. He was refuting a particular group that denied that God had a son that became flesh. They denied everything about inherent flesh or matter. They just flatly denied it. Um, Jesus's body was something that seemed to be a physical body, but they denied all physicality. This is what John was dealing with. And he says this, many false prophets have gone into the world in verse two, by this, you know, the spirit of God. Now here, now he defines Christian orthodoxy. He says this, every spirit that uh, homo legato, that confesses inwardly, outwardly confesses with everything they have that Jesus Christ, listen to this passage, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess this, or Jesus, is not from God. When he says every spirit that confesses Jesus has come, that verb there, it's a perfect tense, eleuthida. It denotes a past action, right, a completed action, with continuous results. So literally, in the Greek text, by this you'll know who a Christian is, who the Spirit of God is. Uh, um, every spirit that confesses, that believes, that Jesus Christ, here we go with the perfect, has come and remains in the flesh. And John says, if you don't believe this, if you don't confess this, John says, this is the spirit of Antichrist. And in 2 John 1.7, he calls these people that do not confess the perpetual incarnation, he calls them the, with the definite article there, Antichrist, and the deceiver. I mean, for John, this is a mark of orthodoxy. This is a mark of true Christianity to believe that he has come and remains in the flesh. Who's coming back again physically? John, uh, Acts 17, the, the God the Father is going to, he appointed a day where she's going to send his son, the man, Jesus Christ. Who is our mediator right now? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 5, our mediator is who? It's Christ. It says the man. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. So it's a very important doctrine, and we as Christians have to defend it, but we have to understand that Jesus Christ is forever 
God in the flesh. And this is part, as Paul says, this is part of my gospel. This is my, according to the gospel, he says, he was of the spermatos of David. So that's how important that doctrine is. Yeah. And if you deny it, John says, this is the spirit of Antichrist, and you are a deceiver. Yeah, important indeed, very important. And we know that we have a lot of uh, Muslim guests, or m not guests, <laughs> Muslim uh, viewers throughout the world. And um, we, in Dr. Samples, it was already talk, talking on that point of Islam. And uh, I have a, a, a huge heart for Muslims, and Islam is one of the areas that I, I focus on personally. And we only have about uh, four minutes left in the show, but I want to uh, allow Dr., uh, Dr. Samples to continue on uh, that specific topic. Um, what, what are the biggest, one of the biggest inconsistencies that you see with traditionally monotheistic religions like Islam? Um, when it, because it's non-Trinitarian, I mean, we know that Muslims not only deny that Jesus is the Son of God, they say that when we say Son of God, oh, that's just only a title. He's not the eternal Son of God incarnate. Uh, and then, of course, backing up from there, if he's not the eternal Son of God, then there is, of course, no Trinity. But when we look at the, the names of Allah and the, the 99 names, we don't find, or if we do find that he's, he, if we find that he's loving, but we deny the Trinity, there's a problem there. And there, there's a follow-up I want to uh, bring up, but I want you to, to uh, explain that to our viewers and what, what is the problem that you see in Islam claiming that Allah is love but denying the Trinity at the same time. Yeah, I've had two recent conversations, one with a Muslim and another with a, a Jew. And uh, in, the, in the dialogue, talking about so the difference between the, the triune view of God, historic Christian view, uh, traditional Judaism or Islam, at one point in the conversation, I simply asked them, uh, what is a single solid being? If there's no diversity, plurality of persons within God's essence, then who did Allah love in eternity? Because, Tony, as you mentioned, one of the 99 names that is said to describe the eternal nature of Allah is the loving. And it's, it's uh, not a narcissistic love. It's a, a love that is given to another. Well, who did God love in eternity? Now, these were conversations I had both with a Jew and a Muslim. And they were stunned by that. They, they were silenced by that. You know, if, if Allah is a single solitary being before he creates the world, before he creates angels and human beings, who does this God love? And if we think of Allah as being uh, the equivalent to a sovereign God, who is he sovereign over? So what's interesting, I think, about this, Tony, is that uh, the Trinity is able to ground love. The Father loves the Son and the Spirit from all eternity. Whereas uh, when we look specifically at Islam, Allah seems as if he needs to create to derive fulfillment, to give that love, to be, to be satisfied. But of course, another feature of the Quran is that Allah depends on no one and nothing. So I think it's, it is a very powerful uh, tool to use as we talk with Muslims and even Jews. And I, I would even say one further thing that I think is very critical. You know, many, many Christian people, uh, they wonder how God can love them. You know, uh, love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Well, most of us don't find that to be an easy task. We wonder, how can God love me when I'm an imperfect person? But I think the doctrine of the Trinity tells God ground He is love. Uh, it's not just that he has loving quality, but he is the very foundation, the ground of love itself. So I will say that to people, both Jews and Muslims, I will ask them, uh, who did Yahweh love in eternity? If he's a single solitary person, who did he love in eternity? Was he alone? Uh, did he need to create to, to derive fulfillment? And it was kind of stunning that in two times with Muslims, another time with a Jewish fellow, uh, they said to me after a long discussion, I don't know who Allah loved in eternity. So I think is a very, very critical element. The doctrine of the Trinity 
It's not only true, not only biblical, not only critically important that we believe it as Orthodox Christians, but it also tells us something about the very nature of God himself. The Father has, for all eternity, loved the Son in the Holy Spirit. And so John says, God is love. Thank you for sharing that. And we want to thank our guests. We want to thank Dr. Lynn Wilder, Dr. Edward Dalcor, and Dr. Ken Samples on our show today. Um, I think, viewers, you, you've had a whole lot of uh, information thrown at you. So I would encourage you to find this video on the YouTube channel, share it online, watch it again, etc. And I love how Dr. Ken Samples uh, explains that aspect of love. Now, we do have Muslims who have asked, well, uh, they deny that, and they say, well, um, what about God being wrathful? Well, who is he wrathful towards uh, before he created? Uh, the problem is that the God's wrath flows from his justice. God is just. It's just like if I love uh, children, if I love babies, then I hate abortion. Do I, do, do I hate the act itself? Well, it flows from my love for children. So if there were never any abortions performed, well, then I wouldn't hate abortion. But if one happens my hatred come for it is because of my love for children. So God doesn't, didn't need someone uh, from all of eternity to be wrathful towards. God is just, just like God is love. God is infinite in all that he is. Uh, he doesn't have certain amounts of these different attributes. He just is. I am that I am. So before any human mind existed to give God these specific attributes, uh, he was who he was. And the God of the universe is one, but he's also three in person. And it's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who we find in the New Testament alone. And the reason why this is so important, and the love aspect, and the wrath aspect, is because all of us are sinners in the hands of a very angry God. Not because he's angry from all eternity, but we have sinned against him. And he is perfect, we are not. He hasn't uh, sinned against us. We've sinned against him. We don't need to accept Jesus. He needs to accept us. We're the ones who have sinned. So we pray that all of you out there, if you've never repented and put your trust in Christ, that you would do that today. And we would ask that you would uh, get before God, let him know that the sins that you've committed. Look at the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 5. We've all broken these. We all need a Savior and the Savior is found in the Bible, in the New Testament. Look to the words of Jesus himself. Look at the perfect life that he lived, the death that he died on our behalf, and then rising in glory three days later. He did that because this God, who is just and holy and perfect, also loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. He died for me. He died for our guest today. He died for all of you. So we ask you to please repent and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for joining us on this show. We'll be back in just a half hour for the show titled Sharia versus Freedom and Human Rights. So please come back in 30 minutes to join us for that show. God bless you. Every day, ABN is producing and recording new programs. We need you to help us hand in hand by sending your donations to our P.O. Box 724 Wald Lake, Michigan 48390 or visit us at www.trinitychannel.com or call us at 248-416-1300.